you wanted that, I'm gonna start recording. Okay, three, three two, two, one. one. Boom. <laughs> so we are live. Good afternoon, everybody from all around the world. And I can see already in the attendees box that we have people from the US, we have people from Europe, of course, we have people from Asia. So from all around the world, people are attending uh, the Crypto Wednesday show. So thank you for joining and also for the people that are watching the recording. We're also grateful for you. Please share the recording link with your community friends. That would be really cool. So just to introduce the, the concept for the people that are new to the show. Uh, about four months ago, Gordon, my good friend and myself, we took the initiative on creating a community platform with a weekly show, which is called Crypto Wednesday Show, where we are inviting industry friends from our networks to give back to the industry, to give back to the crypto and blockchain industry. And we've been uh, very grateful to have some really great friends joining the show. And we're also happy to have Tone today in the show. Because Tone, you, you participated also last week. And one of our, let's say, dreams for the Crypto Wednesday Show came, came true because we are in the first few weeks talking about crypto, projects, blockchain, all the techie stuff, you know, high frequency trading all over the place. But all of a sudden, yeah, uh, last week, we were also talking about, you know, universal laws, business, contributing back, and also health and well-being. And what, what, what some of you know is that in the past 25 years, I've been involved in the fitness and well-being and nutrition industry. So this is one of my two passions. The other one is the crypto and blockchain industry, but this is a big thing also for me. So I... I we are both, Gordon and myself, really happy to have Tone on the show so we can address those two subjects. So before we get, get started, my name is Sander de Bruin. I'm uh, today uh, dialing in from Amsterdam in the Netherlands, that's in Europe. And my, but my good friend Gordon, you're not in Europe yet. because Yes, damn it. I'm not in there yeah. yet. <laughs> I put a focus on yet. So tell us, you're still in LA, right? Uh, hi everyone, this is Gordon Einstein, uh, just a quick intro, uh, Gordon Einstein, I am an attorney, I do crypto law, in other words crypto and blockchain law, mostly working with startups, as Sandra mentioned, uh, we started this show a few months ago, just because we like engaging with people in the community and it's really taken off and we're, we're thrilled to have our friend Tone Bays on the show, Tone, you, you're looking beautiful man and I, I love your man cave, it's very high tech, and yes, to answer the question, I'm still stuck in freaking Los Angeles, that's why I have these bright lights and it's dark outside. It's just after 5.30 a.m. here. I'm doing my best to get over to Europe and join you good people or get, get the hell out of Dodge. But, you know, 2020 is the year of complexity. So I, I'm rolling with it. But I'm, th this show is, is, is probably more social than I am the rest of the week. So God bless you all. I feel like I got, you know, 100 virtual friends now. This is cool. And... I have a dabbling interest in health and nutrition. I probably could have more. Uh, my, my wife, Marina, is very into it. She may join. She studies up on it, and she's been an inspiration to me. And she and Sandra have had talks. So, And she and Tone actually had a good conversation. I remember in Malta, um, where they got really into like you know the pros and cons of eating liver and just liver. And I was like, what the hell are these people talking about? So I'm, I, I didn't know about this aspect of Tone's personality or side. I mean, I kind of knew about it. I thought it was an avocation or something, but I didn't realize it was quite so strong and quite so mathematical and quite so objective and thought out. And I know Sonder is very interested in this topic. So part of the joy, I think, of Crypto Wednesdays is it's just whatever you want to talk about Wednesdays. Obviously, we can keep it on crypto because you know that's the focus of our lives, but it's kind of neat to like go over back and forth. Um, Sonder, do you want to go over the ground rules just for a minute? Just to... Yeah, 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 because we have a lot of new people. And I'm going to keep on inviting people in because we got a bunch. <laughs> Yeah, cool. So we, are, we have a lot of uh, new people on the show. So just as a quick summary on how we handle the show is that the first part of the show, Gordon and myself, we will lead the conversation. We will get asked Tony some questions. You know, he gives us insights. He gives us ideas and so forth and so forth. But in the second part of the show, you can be part of the show. So you can already put uh, questions in the chat box. We're going to open up mics in the second part of the show. We're going to open up videos. But in the meantime, please keep your microphone and your video close for optimal streaming. But in the second part, you're more than welcome to join the show. And this is for our attendees, but also for our alumni speakers. So speakers that have been part of the show in previous weeks or months. And by the way, I, I think I see our buddies, Marco and Timothy, our, our famous alumni speakers. We probably have others, but yes, they're coming on already, whatever time zone they're in. So we got to say thank you. 
Cool, cool, cool. So I think everybody's f fine, fine with, with that. Um, I think we can get started. And, and what, what we usually do, Tone, is we ask our guest speaker, although a lot of people already know you, but just give us a little background on who you are, where you are in the world today, you know, what you're working on. Let, let's kick off uh, on, on, on that subject. I want the Tony Bay's yeah, sure. origin story, like Wolverine. Go. <laughs> Hey, thanks, guys. Um, uh, pl pleasure to meet you, Sander. We met, uh, well, well, I jumped on the show last week for like 10, 15 minutes. Uh, Gordon and I have met uh, in many places around the world from Ukraine to, oh, man, like uh, Malta and somewhere in Asia, probably, too. And don't forget the, the spa in Georgia. Oh, Georgia. Yeah. Like so we had random. an spa experience. We were on the balcony broadcasting the show live in in bathrobes it was very yeah hot. yeah uh randomly we were both in georgia at the same time of all the countries in the world it was the most random thing ever uh but uh yeah it was a, it's always a pleasure uh hanging out with you and uh yeah my name is tom vase i come from the traditional wall street environment was there for about 10 years uh, mostly working on risk models but involved in the world of trading uh quit my job in uh, er, very early 2015, uh, mostly for two things. One is to just be an independent trader because I got tired of working for other people. And two, I was kind of interested in Bitcoin and that was more of a hobby at the time, but I slowly started becoming a public speaker and uh, being more and more on YouTube. And that was more fun than sitting at home being a trader. So I pursued that avenue of being, uh, I guess what they now call an influencer. But at the time it was more just uh, getting your opinion out there, trying to educate people about Bitcoin and crypto. And I really enjoyed the travel. Uh, last year, I probably went to about 40 countries around the world. And this year started off the same way. Uh, prior to COVID, I was already in New Zealand, Australia, Philippines, Mexico, uh, Indonesia, uh, and South Africa. Wait, I mean, I'm and sorry, then, you're saying that was in 2020? Before that was in 2020, yeah. Uh, oh, and I ran my own conference in Vegas uh, in February, Unconfiscatable. Uh, so I did all of that uh, from the start of the year to the middle of March. And then I had to come back to the US and I've been stuck here ever since. So I can't wait to uh, head back out again. Uh, but other than that, nutrition has become what you what the 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 hobby uh, during my Wall Street days was crypto, and then crypto became kind of my life for the last six to seven years. And now that this feels more like work, uh, nutrition, proper eating, proper lifestyle is be uh, has is slowly migrating from a hobby to something I want to pursue uh, more intensely. So in about maybe three years. Uh, I'm thinking there might be a transition. Uh, I might give crypto a break and uh, move into the whole nutrition field. I may even go back to school and get a master's degree. Uh, kind of didn't plan on it. Uh, planned on, I didn't want to go back to school. I already did seven years in school. You as a lawyer probably know what, that, what that's like because uh, I already have three degrees, not that I'm putting any of them to use. Uh, but it was fun getting, well, interesting getting them. I want to say fun. This next one would be fun. So if I do go back for a master's in nutrition, uh, I wouldn't care about my grades. I wouldn't care if I only get C's. Uh, it would just be, what am I learning? And am I enjoying it? Yep. And actually, Arturo in the chat just made an interesting comment that I know you're very tuned into. I'm, I'm going to break protocol. He said, look into inter intermittent fasting and autophagy, which I think is a topic dear to all our hearts. Uh, but we'll, we'll get into that. That's the whole, yeah. I, 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 Arturo, been there, done that. It's great. And I'm sure Tony knows more than I do. And it sounds like you know more than we than I do, not more than him necessarily. Um, Tony, but give, give us, like, where were you born? <laughs> oh, uh, so I was born in what is what was the Soviet Union at the time, uh, basically pretty much Moscow. And uh, my family came over here in the late 80s, like uh, around 1989. Uh, is when we left Russia. Uh, the road to get here was through Italy and uh, Austria. So mm -hmm. left in 89, came to the U.S. in 1990. It took about six months to get to the U.S., spent about four to six months in Italy. Uh, and before that, about a month or two in Austria. 
Mm -hmm. uh, so that was that was interesting. That was, that was interesting. I was uh, uh, I, I was pretty How young. Were you? When this all happened? Uh, I, I, I was like nine, ten. I'm giving away my age here. Uh, okay. I was uh, uh, more or less. Just in, give me yeah. the decade. <laughs> yeah, it was. Um, but it was good. Like for so for while in Italy for about four to six months, I actually didn't go to school. Uh, I was around you know nine, ten years old. I was actually working. Uh, so I had a job. Uh, instead of going to school. So that, that was a nice uh, life lesson. Uh, the job was literally running out in the middle of traffic uh, to wash uh, car windows uh, during red lights. And that's what you do when you're eight, nine years old in foreign countries. So I uh, survived. Uh, here, you can't even cross the street till you're like 12, but over there. Uh, <laughs> I, well, yeah, we have, we have the late maturity in the United States, traffic. big time. So, okay, that's amazing. So you came here. And then you're, how do I say this? You're, look, I, I'm not Mr. Bitcoin trader. I'm, I'm kind of Mr. Hordel, but the impression I get from you and what I've seen of you and your presentations is you're very much on the technical side. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I'm more of a technical analyst. Uh, fundamentals, uh, the, people confuse fundamental analysis when it comes to investing with reading and watching the news. Those are not the same thing. Um, a lot of retail traders think that what they see on the news, they can use in their trading, which is kind of ridiculous, actually. Uh, you can get lucky every now and then, but once it's in the news, you have no information. You have the same information that everybody else does. Uh, a true fundamental analysis is actual research that others are not doing. Everyone has access to a television. So uh, I try to educate people that there's a big difference between uh, reacting to publicly available information and news events versus digging into what may be publicly available, but no one is actually doing the digging. Or like a real hedge fund, if you ever watch Billions, you basically dig into yeah, you're basically looking at stuff that no one else has information to. And it's debatable whether you should or should not have access to that information. That is true fundamental analysis. And my view on the markets is that the average person doesn't have the ability, nor the time, nor the resources to do true fundamental analysis. And reacting to news events is a way to really get you into trouble. So the only advantage a small at-home trader has versus a big uh, hedge fund is technical analysis because uh, everything, all the possible news is always reflected in the price of an asset at all times. And there are patterns that have a greater than 50% chance of repeating, whether it's only 51% or 52%. And if you focus and you let me, do let me pause you. is that actually true? Is that statistically borne out that some patterns have a greater than average probability of repeating once they appear? Uh, I believe that, that it is. It just requires a lot of discipline. And you have to keep in mind that just because something has a little bit of an advantage, it doesn't mean that it's always going to work out. And, and the best ex example of that I bring is the, the casino industry. Uh, I mean, an average game in a casino only has a one or a 2% chance for the house. Uh, that's why they feed you a lot of free alcohol to put the odds in their favor. Mm -hmm. And if you are uh, able to count cards, for example, in blackjack, you can swing those odds in your favor. But those odds are only by a couple of percentage points. Mm -hmm. uh, but being able to stay disciplined and being able to uh, really harness that craft, uh, that one to two percent advantage could lead to significant returns over time uh, but uh people that think that they can just jump into this and immediately become rich uh, they get very disappointed very very quickly just like any other gambler uh, so i do think that uh basically think of uh technical analysis as like a card counter that you're not going to get you know taken into the back room and beaten up if the casino finds out you're actually counting cards, but just because counting cards give some people an advantage, it doesn't mean that everyone can count cards and win. Uh, so that's basically the best analogy I can give to technical analysis. It requires 
uh, a lot of patience. It requires a lot of skill. It requires, uh, it's a, it's basically is a full-time job. Uh, but those that are able to do it well, do come away with a slight advantage versus those that don't. Now, now let me throw this at you. By the way, fantastic comments. Fantastic. The, I, I love, I think it's very intriguing that you said that fundamental analysis is about uncovering non-public or semi-public or public but not recognized information and that it's extremely hard for an individual to operate at appropriate scale, time and energy and resources in order to pull that off. Can that be done by just laser focusing on a very small slice of assets and going deep on those assets? Can an individual stand up a good fundamental analysis strategy or is it just beyond possibility? We might as well throw up our hands and go to technical. And by the way, I don't have an answer in my mind. I'm, I'm, I'm curious what you think. I don't have a predisposition. I, I think it's possible, but that person would really have to narrow down to just one or two assets. I think right now in the space, uh, the only one that's probably giving people the best opportunity for true fundamental analysis is actually Bitcoin, because it's a big enough asset with a whole new way of doing fundamental analysis because every single Bitcoin transaction is on the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, so there are people uh, like my friend, Wooly Wu, who was on my show earlier this week, uh, David Poole and uh, several others that are spending, uh, you know, it's almost a full-time job to do this fundamental on-chain Bitcoin analysis. And they are able uh, to see what's going on under the hood of Bitcoin. But you also have to keep in mind that those uh, trades that they make off of that information are not short-term trades. They are designed to last for at least weeks, probably months, up to years. So these are bigger macro trades, which is great if you have a large pool of money and it's also good if you have another main primary source of income using this information as more of an investment thesis. So those traders that are focused more on fundamental analysis, uh, that is more of managing your retirement portfolio, managing uh, a, either a larger pool of money at a slower pace than something like a day trader or a swing trader that needs uh, returns, consistent returns on a monthly basis to pay their bills. Huh. You know what? I, I guess James Happ is in here. He says, he says to use car counting analysis, tech analysis is the strategy and the newsfeed are the cards. This is James Happ from Powell Capital made that comment. Um, Hi. So, Hi, James. Thank you for joining. Yeah, he's, he's there. And actually, Marina's coming in, which is nice. Uh, hold on. So you, you segued into something else. We're, we're going to deep dive nutrition a lot, but you segued into something else. And there's James. Can you talk about your, your show? Good morning, James. I, I read your comment live. Uh, there he is looking comfortable. <laughs> hey, James. Wait. Um, can you talk about your show and then dive into your, your conferences? Each one of them is a, like a special gym and it's very interesting, but talk about how you sure. started it was, I'm sorry, let me, before you hear me say, since we just went through this ourselves, talk about how you, the idea came to you to start your podcast slash YouTube show. What was that like starting it and then go into your, your three conferences, please? Sure. You know what? I might as well just jump into screen share on my sure. YouTube channel. Uh, so, so here's the YouTube channel. So the way I started it, uh, it wasn't on purpose, but it was really smart uh, the way it turned out. A lot of people, there's a lot of people with interesting stuff to say, uh, but what they don't realize is just because they all start a YouTube channel or start a podcast, masses don't necessarily have to show up because they don't know you're there. And a lot of people end up very, very disappointed that they think they have an audience and people and a few people are telling them, uh, to start a podcast and then they start a podcast and no one's coming to listen. So what happened with me was I really eased into it. I spoke at a couple of conferences. I leveraged my Wall Street background to speak at a couple of conferences that led to some, a uh, couple of interviews. 
a lot to me being a guest on a few podcasts. And then I joined the World Crypto Network uh, YouTube channel as a regular guest. Like I was on their Friday news show. And then I was on a technical analysis show. And I was uh, probably the main guy, the most consistent guy on the technical analysis show, which became more popular because I was there. So I gained my popularity in the podcasting space without having my own podcast. And then when enough people kept saying, when you're going to start your own, when you're going to start your own, I finally did. So when I started my podcast, I already had an audience. And though it was a little disappointing that my very first YouTube video only got about 500 views, because considering I was getting thousands of views on the World Crypto Network, um, over time, uh, it, uh, you know, it, it, it rose up a bit. And I've tried several different podcasts on my YouTube channel. We have the price analysis shows. Um, I interview people sometimes through the On the Record series. I had a series. Uh, called- I'm sorry. Let me let me pause for a second because you know, as a neophyte YouTuber, so you're starting different playlists within your YouTube channel. It looks like different thematic playlists, or are these shows within shows? Yeah. So, I mean, the playlist is just like or organizing the, the shows. So you've been on our law show. So here's another playlist. So um, I, I think I'm doing a little too much because I'm in between this. I'm in this niche where I am an interviewer, but I am also an expert that, well, I don't like to call myself an expert, but people yeah. treat me as an expert to interview me. So I'm playing both roles as being a podcast host, an interviewer, and being interviewed. At the same time, uh, some people want to know about Bitcoin and blockchain, and some people want to know about trading and price. So I'm also in the middle of those two worlds, not being able to pick a direction. Uh, But I always like to learn, and that's why I'm doing all this stuff. So I had a series called Crypto Scam where we... I mm-hmm. critically explored a lot of the old coins in the space. I uh, had an on the record series where I would interview people. Uh, I, we had the law show series. We have the news series with Jimmy. You didn't Song. have the law show series. You have the law show series. And that's I the have, best I series. haven't done it in months. It's been months since the last show. Well, okay, you just need to feature me. And if anyone else joins, then fine. I, I got some wisdom. <laughs> All right, go on. We'll, go on. Uh, we'll do it. We'll get the show back. Anyway, so so that's the YouTube channel. That's kind of how I started and how it's going. I've been dying to crack a hundred thousand subscribers. I've been stuck in the nineties, like since early last year, and I kind of plateaued because I'm not doing a lot of the SEO stuff. I'm not doing a lot of the clickbaiting stuff. Uh, I'm not doing a lot of the things like uh, it was great in the beginning. My content. It got me a lot of subscribers, but now in order to compete, even in crypto, because so many people joined the crypto space, it's a lot of it is about uh, not necessarily the content. A lot of it is about proper promotion of your content to get all of the subscribers. And um, right. uh, it's just not, I don't want that to be a focus. Uh, so we'll see. Hopefully I'll break 100,000 subscribers soon. And I do have three conferences. This is uh, one of them, the financial summit. That takes place at a very high-end resort in Bali, and it's for traders and hedge funds uh, to collaborate and share ideas on trading. Sorry, let me break in. You you had this last year, and it's a real success. I'm I'm sorry I missed it, but you you told me that the people involved were very happy. Oh, yeah. It was a huge success. It was a big risk uh, considering the expense of this event. It's a small event. It's only designed for about 30 to 40 attendees. And uh, it was all the way in Bali and people came from the US, people came from all over the world. Uh, We didn't sell out the 30 maximum, which is good. Uh, And everyone was able to spend a lot of time talking and networking with each other, a lot of high net worth individuals. Um, We also have an event in Malta called Understanding Bitcoin. And this was something that I kept hoping somebody else would do in the crypto space and nobody did. So mm-hmm. I approached Adam Back, uh, one of the uh, people highlighted by Satoshi in the white paper. I'm not sure why the, there it is. Uh, why I, I was about going. to say your Cloudflare needs to. Yeah. And it, uh, it, maybe so... your IP is damaged. No, just, oh, Giacomo, my buddy and Adam. Yep. Cool. Yep. My, my boys. So, uh, 
So uh, it's myself, Adam and Giacomo are the organizers and this event educates about Bitcoin technology where we bring Bitcoin developers uh, to the conference to try and do educational presentations on how to use Bitcoin technology. So if you wanted to uh, like actually see and learn how to use the Lightning Network, how to use the Liquid sidechain, mm -hmm. um, how to use uh, hardware wallets, how to set up a miner. Uh, so these are the kinds of things we do at this event. Uh, it's just educating people on how to use uh, Bitcoin technology. Uh, so it's uh, and shout out to my graphic designer. Uh, yeah, amazing. R R Rusty, world of Rusty on Twitter, uh, who puts all of this together. And then my- you know, your, your woman looked very Games of Thrones slash Vikings like, and it's, dare I say, slightly hot. So there you go, you should get <laughs> <Yeah>. good attention. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's a, this is a really great event. And uh, finally, uh, we have Unconfiscatable, which is the t-shirt I'm wearing now. Uh, this is the event that started it all in Las Vegas. Uh, there's also a little poker tournament involved. This year, we want to do some an axe throwing competition. And uh, this is taking place in Las Vegas. We have moved all of these conferences. Uh, this one is supposed to take place in April. And it's a general Bitcoin conferences. We had a law panel here as well uh, last year. And a uh, little bit of everything, a little bit of, uh, of finance and trading, a uh, little bit of technology, just a general conference. But there's no shit coins. There's no old coins. Every speaker is a Bitcoiner. And uh, this is one of very few conferences that is Bitcoin only, no, set, no, no blockchain talk, just Bitcoin. So let, let, me, let me ask you, I mean, it's hard enough Sandra and I were talking about this before the show. It's hard enough to stand up a YouTube channel and be consistent even once per week mm -hmm. and wrangle guests if you have guests and build that audience to do all that stuff. That, that is a full-time job, especially in this competitive environment you're talking about. And I've organized small events and that's freaking crazy. I don't see you surrounded by a million staff people. How, how the hell do you pull this off? <laughs> and, and, what, and what drives you? Yeah, well, that, that was it. It was just this desire to share knowledge uh, that's been uh, driving me to do it. I run my, I, I don't really run it daily at the moment, but uh, there was a stretch where I was doing two videos a day. Uh, we would do like wow. a news show in the morning. I'll probably do a price show at night. Uh, but the thing is, uh, with my shows, uh, the reason why I'm able to do a daily YouTube show is because it takes very little preparation for me to talk about the price of Bitcoin. So yeah. I just, uh, uh, if I feel like it, like, hey, you know what? I'm just going to go live. It takes me about 15 minutes to set up. I'm not doing any editing. Uh, that's also requires, mm -hmm. you know, a team and coordination. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why some of these other shows uh, fell off, like the me interviewing people requires preparation and studying. Peter McCormick has been uh, basically kind of dominating that space in the podcast, but he does a lot of homework and a lot yeah. of research. Uh, the crypto scam series required a lot of uh, research into a project so I can criticize it, uh, you know, without- being too <laughs> So you can say it, uh, so you can criticize it without defaming it. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, so I can criticize it properly. So those <laughs> podcasts took a lot of research, which was easy to do in the beginning. Uh, but now I wake up in the morning, I get a bunch of messages uh, that I have to reply to, to people. And uh, it makes it challenging to uh, do editing, to, you know, study ahead of time. Uh, but getting on and talking about what you already know is easy, which is why it's easy for Jimmy Song and I to talk about the news in crypto, because we've seen it all before. I mean, there's nothing new. We've been doing this for six, uh, almost seven years now, uh, just reading about everything in crypto. So if a new piece of news comes out, uh, we don't really need to dig into the project. We usually are pretty accurate. It uh, may take a few years for our views on that project to come to fruition, but they are coming, but, but they are going to come. And we are 99% confident that, that what we say will be accurate uh, within a few years uh, because everything always takes more time. But something like price of Bitcoin and something like nutrition, I do need to study a little bit more so I can talk about it um, uh, more accurately uh, of with, uh, with some of the details, but I, I know what I eat and I know how I feel now versus 10, 15 years ago, even 20 years ago and how much better I feel. So I can talk about that stuff without much preparation. Mm -hmm. Same thing with trading and reading charts, something I've been doing for 
20 years now, uh, I don't need preparation for that. I can just jump on, hit the live button and analyze a chart and take Q&A questions and uh, look at my charts. Uh, it also- uh, well, let, let, let me pause it because we're definitely gonna hit the nutrition in, in depth. When, for the Valley Conference, I mean, to, that's a huge organizational effort to find a venue, to negotiate it, to have something like that go off well. And it's not sort of a mass event where people are just happy to be there. It sounds like you have a demanding sort of elite crowd. And this is the first time you did it. I mean, did you have help or what? what, what yeah, the no, help? I had help. I had help. I had a, I, I had a couple of people that helped me find the venue and ne negotiate the prices and uh, set everything up there. But at the same time, that event was small. We had about uh, 20 people. Uh, so with a small event, you're able to kind of organize. If that Bali event had 100 people, it would have been an absolute nightmare. Uh, on the other hand, uh, mm -hmm. an event like in Vegas, and each one has actually different organizers, not the same organizer. Uh, each one has a uh, different organizer. Uh, for the Malta event, we leverage uh, Blockstream and their mm -hmm. resources. Uh, their administrative assistance uh, for Unconfiscatable. Uh, there's someone else that manages that entire event, basically like a partner of mine that organizes everything. And I'm more of just like the face of the event. Uh, and the Bali event, I have a different organizer uh, that uh, profits from what the event profits, basically. And uh, helping me uh, talk to the venue and making sure that, you know, we have our private dinners and we have the... Wow. The, the so you're, you're smartly teaming up with other compatriots or collaborators in order to get this done. It's not tone based at three o'clock in the yeah, morning, no, banging no, off an email to the yeah. caterer. Yeah, no, that would be pretty much impossible. But yeah, and also uh, that's not my expertise. I really don't enjoy, you know, negotiating contracts and dealing with venues. It's not my specialty. It's not something I like. It's uh, so I, I wouldn't be doing that. And that's why uh, it took so long for that understanding Bitcoin conference to happen because without someone like Adam back, I wouldn't even be able to get some of those high uh, valued developers because sure. they don't really, I, I don't have access to them, but Adam does. So, uh, so that was, uh, th th that was great. So that's a good segue because actually you, me, Adam, Marina, were sitting at that restaurant in Malta when you guys got into that epic nutrition conversation that I just barely understood. And I was sitting there trying to nod and sound intelligent, but you all went at it in a way that was very impressive. So let, 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 talk about how you're interested in that developed and your basic thesis, if you like, and we'll go from there. Sure. Uh, I've always wanted to eat healthy and exercise, even going back to college almost going back to high school. I mean, I did play sports in high school. Uh, baseball and volleyball were my uh, top two sports when I was in high school. Uh, but, you know, out there and play um, on playgrounds with my friends, pretty much played everything. Uh, well, not hockey, not tennis, but uh, football, basketball, uh, pretty much just playing everything with friends. But as far as being able to actually be competitive with strangers, uh, the only uh, sports that I was good at were volleyball and baseball. I tried out for both of those in college as well. Uh, did, uh, uh, well didn't make either, other, either squad, uh, but I, I kept playing volleyball uh, all the way up to until Bitcoin. I was still playing on Division A wow. uh, local teams uh, in New York City. Uh, so that one I kept up with, played in uh, uh, very competitive intramurals at Florida State because Florida State didn't have a, uh, a, re a volleyball team. Uh, so, but all the graduate students had played on like Division A undergrad. So there was some serious competition at Florida State that was, that was just, you know, so internal. Let me get this straight. You were at Florida, State, at Florida State playing high level volleyball. You must have had a very good social life. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, it, you know, grad school was kind of hard. I mean, I, I was there for grad school. It was kind of mm. hard, but Florida State is such a party school. Yeah. So it was, uh, it, it was not easy. I was actually on academic probation after my first semester in my graduate program. I was studying financial engineering. And, uh, and I kind of want to say I partied too much and I ended up on academic probation, but that's not actually true. I got two Bs and a B minus 
in my first semester and that put me on academic probation. It was like the funniest conversation with my advisor ever. Like mm -hmm. I, I just got three Bs, like, come on, you can't be serious. Uh, because if you drop under a 3.0 GPA, um, yeah, uh, you, you get an academic probation in grad school and that B minus put me like a two nine or something like that, two nine five. Uh, but anyway, okay. that degree was not easy, even though it was at Florida State. So I was always about eating healthy, but the problem is everyone wants to eat, uh, like, I'm not going to say everyone wants to eat healthy. Uh, like I still see my, my old college roommate still goes to freaking McDonald's or Burger King, which is insane. And he's actually in decent shape. But uh, at the same time, you want to eat healthy, but you don't know what healthy is. And everything that I was doing when I was in my 20s is almost the complete opposite of what I'm doing now, though I was never a vegan. So it's not the exact opposite. I, I was always a meat eater, uh, just... I guess Russian, like it's, it was funny. You know, like it's a, I, I don't know if it's possible to find a Russian that's a vegan that's, uh, you know, oh. over 25 years old, no. over 25. Uh, <laughs> I see. Did you ever see the movie? Did you ever see the movie Everything is Illuminated? No, never heard of it actually. Uh, so some guy, some guy from the West goes to like some, you know, Poland or somewhere to like find his Semitic roots before the Holocaust. And he goes to some hotel and he just wants to order a potato because he doesn't eat meat. And the waitress is like, potato with meat no just a potato P potato with steak you know it's like your, your brain <laughs> couldn't process the idea of just a potato because you know you have meat and then you have whatever else so go, go right. on <laughs> so uh so, so that part uh I, I was always a meat eater but uh all these concepts of you know you're supposed to eat every four hours you want to eat four or five times a day yeah. uh which is the opposite of what i'm doing now uh also uh, eating a lot of vegetables is the opposite of what I'm doing now. This, uh, uh, I, I always knew that uh, bread and carbs were not good. That one I learned in my 20s, but I was still eating a lot of that stuff, a lot of sugars, uh, uh, a lot of sweets. Well, I, I'll, I'll, I'll channel Marina here, I think, and maybe I'll, maybe she'll join in at some point. But the, is it that bread is bad or is it, is it that American bread with our GMO and all that other crap is bad? I mean, I don't see the French getting fat on bread, but what, what's your uh, idea? Yeah, uh, I mean, that, that, that's a good point. It's, see, that's the thing. It's always a combination of things. Uh, the, the French are doing other stuff that is, uh, that is fine. Like, for example, rice is also carbs, and uh, rice is in the same uh, boat as bread and pasta, and yet the Chinese are not overweight at all. Uh, neither is pretty much most people in Asia. So uh, it, that, it's not the only thing. Uh, it, it, it's a combination of many things. And this is also why when people go vegan or vegetarian, uh, they feel a lot better and they start to look a lot better in the beginning. And uh, the main argument there is that's not because you're eating vegetables. It's because the shit that you stopped eating uh, and eventually and not eating meat and only eating vegetables is going to catch up to you. But in the beginning, you get that phase where you feel great, uh, but that's because you cut other stuff out. Mm -hmm. So bread alone uh, is probably, uh, you, you, you can be okay uh, and you'll be fine, but it's another one of those things that would be nice to cut out if you can. Okay, and by the way, when we were in Georgia, I was eating so much bread. So, so there's, only, there's two breads I cannot stay away from. And uh, one of them is uh, a Jerian Kachapuri or just Kachapuri, yes. but mostly the Jerian version mm. that is insane. And uh, if you put that in front of me, that bread is being eaten. Kachapuri uh, is like the best thing ever on the planet. It's like it whenever, whenever I go like Easter Berlin, I'm, I'm hitting it as much as I can. Uh, th those that are watching, and if you don't know how to spell it, just start Googling Ajarian, A-D-J, first three letters, uh, Kachapuri, K-A-C-H-P. So start Google that, and uh, you'll see what, what, what uh, it's better than any pizza, though it looks a little bit like it. And the other bread that I really can't stay away from is Indian naan bread, like the garlic naan. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's hard for me to stay away from those breads, and the and the one bread sweet that I also can't stay away from is baklava, 
which is like the Turkish. And yeah, like we, we know. <laughs> yeah. but so, whenever we go to Turkey, we bring back boxes and boxes of it with the intention of giving it away. And then we, we don't quite give away as much as we plan to. <laughs> and for some reason, we have some extra lying around the house that we enjoy for the next month or so. Right. Yeah. So, um, so there are like these, she goes, oh, look, you still have to like enjoy life somehow. Uh, so I try to be as good as I can with my diet when I can. And uh, when I see these things in front of me, I do take a break. And I'm like, you know what? I'm in Georgia for a week. I'm going to pig out on Kachipuri. Uh, but then once I'm back, I'm back for good. What, um, uh, what I try not to let happen is I try not to let like others influence that. So mm -hmm. the common saying goes, uh, like every time you go to dinner with your friends, everyone is like, well, why can't you eat that? Can't you just eat it this one time? What they don't realize is like tomorrow, mm -hmm. someone else is going to say the same statement, right? So it's not this one time. It's uh, every single person you have food with. So it's, mm -hmm. uh, um, so, so it's best to just order like a really big steak on the menu and they can see that you have no other room. So this is why I tend to order a tomahawk every now and then. They give me a 40, uh, 40 to 45 ounce steak. And then it makes sense why I'm not eating the size. Yeah, so let me, let me get this straight. You're ordering a tomahawk as a social engineering technique to get your friends to shut up. <laughs> Sometimes, yeah. Wow. Okay. That's, that's innovative. It, it, it's actually a lot. It, it's great when they're paying for it too. Oh, snap. Okay. Yeah. Also, you know, it's like, no, no, no. Don't get any sides. You're good. You're good, buddy. It's okay. So are, are you, you do dr drill into that veganism thing? Because I, back in college, tried that for all of two weeks. And I was like, oh, God, this is, a, this is terrible. Now, but by the way, sorry, before you answer that, I can, you know, I'm a, I'll date myself. I'm the child of the 70s and the 80s. And my mom, God bless her, was following U.S. dietary recommendations at that time. So we had margarine. We had all kinds. It wasn't like a complete nutritional disaster, but it was typical American food and guidance at that point, which was all wrong. I mean, it was a traditional food pyramid, which is again, all wrong. And I feel like I've been spending years of my life sort of undoing that stuff. And thank God, you know, like, I don't think the fundamental structures of my body got damaged because, you know, I think we bounced back pretty fast, but it's, it's, it's the worst thing. And this is before the internet. It's the worst thing being fed false information from people you trust and parents thinking they're doing well for you and then finding out later that they screwed you over. I mean, it's, I don't know. It's like, eh. <laughs> oh, air, airflow, mute yourself, please. Thank you. Yeah. So Tone, just talk about the veganism part. Talk about how you escaped from the matrix of the false information. Sure. Uh, that's the thing. I wasn't down a path that badly, but it was a, it, it, was, it was a slow process. I would say that, um, I mean, I was reading Men's Health Magazine for several years and that, I mean, it's not bad. It's not, uh, uh, it did help me with a couple of things. At least it made me understand uh, the processed sugars and all the sweets and some things are easy to cut out. You just gotta, uh, it, it's really difficult to go cold turkey on a lot of this stuff. Uh, for some people it's better, for some people it's not. Uh, the easiest thing to cut out really needs to be soda. And mm -hmm. it kills me. Like I go to my uh, relative's house and all they drink is it's like diet Coke, diet Coke. And it's uh, like, come on, this is so bad. And all I drink That's is- a, I, Amazing I drink comment because I'm sorry, when you said soda, my brain immediately went to sugared soda, but then you use diet Coke as an example. Can you drill in on that at all? Like what's wrong with it, soda it, generically? I, you know, it's, I don't even know. I just, I, this is what I mean. This is- I need to go and actually study so I can answer these questions more intelligently. Uh, but what I do know is it just, if it doesn't look or feel natural, you shouldn't be eating it. Uh, and I don't see anything in soda that's natural. Like anytime I look at an ingredients list, like it, it, it does kill me. Like I try to, uh, even the smallest things, even when I buy my coconut water, I want one ingredient, coconut water. And, uh, and, I'll over, uh, and I'll overpay for it. Like, I don't understand why you're going to buy, there was like 18 different choices for coconut water and only like three of them have ingredient, only three of the brands have an ingredient that says coconut water and nothing else. Like, and it's, uh, 
just glance at that ingredient list. And the longer it is, the more likely it is you shouldn't be eating it or, or drinking it. Mm-hmm. And just look at the ingredient list of Coke, whether it's Diet Coke, whether it's regular Coke. I can't remember the last time I looked at it, but you should know that you should not be eating that. Mm-hmm. Um, so for me, a lot of it is uh, just looking at the ingredient list and seeing all the chemicals that are there, seeing all the things I don't recognize there. Uh, and you want to keep that to a minimum, keep as many chemicals out of your body as possible. And I did write an article about my food and it's basically threefold. And uh, some people put more emphasis on one over the other, but it's what food you're eating, the quality of that food and how often you eat it. So to me, it's, though, it's a combination of those three things. And even focusing on a single one of those three things will improve your health and your basically lifestyle. Uh, but attempting to look at, do all three of them uh, is ideal. And that's what I try to do. I try to eat the cleanest food and I try to eat um, mostly uh, natural food, which comes from animals. And I participate in intermittent fasting where I try to eat at most once a day. So are you, are you daily on the one, on OMAD on one meal per day or is that an, an occasional thing? It's almost daily. I mean, sometimes I end up, I would say five times a week I'm eating daily. Uh, and uh, once or twice a week that I don't eat daily, it's not on purpose. It's just that I happen to be hungry early and then I happen to, you know, go out to dinner or something like that. So it's usually by accident or uh, it was actually a lot easier to eat daily when I was doing a lot of traveling. Yes. Uh, it's just so much simpler uh, to eat daily uh, when I travel because I'd always just make dinner plans and then I would work or be at a conference throughout the day. Uh, and when, when you end up eating more than once a day, I'm at a conference and they have like really good buffets. Like I happen to be put in a really nice restaurant and they have an amazing like breakfast brunch buffet. And then there is a, you know, a free dinner for the speakers. So I end up eating more than once a day only because there is a lot of good food. Uh, This is a real danger outside the United States. If you're at like your generic American hotel, I was about to name one, but I don't want to get into trouble. (laughs) It's not like the buffet is like so intriguing, but if you're in Georgia or Armenia or Ukraine or wherever, their their buffets are like, what the hell? (laughs) It's like, I, I can just stay there all day. Yeah. Right. And what happens is in when I'm in a, when I'm traveling and I'm in a foreign country, it's really easy to control uh, your dinner. Uh, it's really easy to control your dinner uh, and make sure you go to a place that has meat or fish, you know, order, you know, a lot of food uh, because that's your one meal for the day. Mm-hmm. But uh, it's a lot harder to control a healthy breakfast or a healthy lunch. Though to me at a hotel breakfast buffet, uh, and the other thing I do is when I purchase a hotel room or an Airbnb, if I purchase an Airbnb, my fridge is usually empty. So I have nothing to eat during the day anyway, if I'm home, I don't have a choice. Mm-hmm. And I'm not just going to go out and eat. Uh, this is another social, tone social engineering way of intermittent fasting. I don't like to like eat alone. Uh, everything changes in quarantine because I have my own apartment, my own fridge. But when on the road, I don't eat alone. So mm. if I happen to not have anyone to hang out with for three days, it's possible I may not eat for three days. Uh, and that's how I go through this like a three-day fast until I have you know, people to go to dinner with. And so that's, are, uh, are, you, are you having the physical sensation of hunger during those three days? Or is your body so tuned in, it's a, it's a nothing? No. So for a lot of people that try to take on a multi-day fast, uh, like some people say, hey, I'm going to, go on a five-day fast. Uh, For them, the hardest day is usually the second or third day. Like usually the third day is a nightmare for most people. For me, because I'm so used to, and uh, I wonder what uh, Sander thinks about this, because I'm so used to (laughs) one a day eating. Mm -hmm. For me, the hardest is like 18 hours or the following morning, in fact. So if I had a like a pretty big, uh, dinner, like a 6 p.m. dinner, not a very late dinner, but like an early large dinner, I wake up starving the next morning. But if I can get into that afternoon, 
I'm good to go for the next two to three days. Like for me, it's the first 24 hours that's hard. And after that, it's a breeze. Uh, yeah. But for a lot of people that don't do intermittent fasting, um, it's uh, the third day is a nightmare. T Tone, maybe as a, as a side note, because we have a lot of people here from all around the, the, the world. And most of them, uh, I think they're not familiar with fasting and or intermittent fasting. Uh, so the, like you just described, the one meal a day, this is like, The, the contrary of what we all been educated by our parents or our school. And so this is like a, a bit of a shock for a lot of people. Um, but can, can you tell the audience what the fasting and also the intermittent fasting is, is all about? Because it works with time windows, right? Um, it does work with time windows. I, I keep my time window pretty small. I try to keep the time window as small as possible. I just want that one big meal, uh, a really big meal. Uh, but uh, I just want to, uh, yeah, I, I didn't get a chance to get mine. So ma ma matcha, good. baby, matcha. That's a, that's a marina thing. I uh, haven't had coffee for since her birthday. Yeah, so. no, I, I, I do like matcha as well. Uh, but uh, so there, there is a book that I, I keep meaning to actually read. So I learned about intermittent fasting from my friends that are constantly doing it and how great they feel and I trust them. Uh, and some of those friends are in the crypto space. So for me, it's more, I'm going to try it and see what it's like. And it's actually been great. Not only do I feel better, it, it, it frees up so much of your time. It makes yeah. you more productive. Like Gordon asked earlier, how am I able to do all this stuff? Well, I don't stop four times a day to eat. Mm -hmm. Like it's, uh, it, it's amazing how much time you free up in your day by not worrying about food until you kind of had an eight, nine hour work day. And you're like, mm -hmm. all right, time to relax, have a nice long dinner. But mm -hmm. the concept of it is like your body, when your body doesn't have food for an extended period of time, it basically uh, diverts more energy to your brain so you can focus better. And it starts to eat away a lot of the fat and it starts to kill a lot of your weak cells and a lot of the uh, uh, the unhealthiness in your body basically starts to die because you're not feeding it. Uh, the unhealthy stuff that, dies. That's autophagy, first. correct? Um, I, I, I believe so. Yeah. Well, here, uh, let, let me see for the audience. Yeah. I, was, I was feeding you the line that that's autophagy when you're, when you're go going into a truly fasted state and your body's burned through everything and you've been in ketosis for a while, it, your body does something that it used to do all the time during evolutionary periods, but we rarely have a chance to do now which is it will basically autophagy is almost like cellular suicide, which is damaged cells will kill themselves. And the protein material gets kind of recycled and built into new fresh cells. And the, the problem is when you're constantly taking in food and constantly when you're, when you're always in a caloric surplus, you're never going to do autophagy. And back when we were like, you know, hunting and eating once every three days or something, it was just a natural evolutionary period. And part of the reason cancer happens so much now is that our damaged cells don't get a chance to die. And so they, they just go on with their mistakes and they replicate with their mistakes and it spins out of control. Yeah. That, that's why the, this propaganda I got fed as a kid, which is you're supposed to have three meals a day and never get hungry and snack all the time and keep your metabolism going by small, having small snacks is fucking hell, pardon my language. Yeah. And it, it's, it, to find this out as an adult is like, it's like, it's, I don't know, it, it, it's kind of, on one hand, I'm so, I'm so grateful to know, know it now, but to have spent all those years being fed this line of BS Partly because I think the government didn't know, but the, the autophagy, you know, the, the guy who came up with this won a Nobel Prize back in the 50s or 60s. This is not new science. It's kind of annoying. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, and that's the thing. Back then, they used to cook on animal fat, like even like McDonald's fries were cooked in animal fat, which, is which good. was so much healthier. <laughs> yeah. Before it got demonized that that's the unhealthy part. And here we go with trans fats, which are the most uh, unhe unhealthy things ever. But uh, the other part, is that here's why it's very challenging for me to take long fasts. Uh, uh, I did one recently that was, I think I made it like maybe 50 hours or so. Mm -hmm. And it was really, really challenging for me to take a long fast. And the problem is, is because first of all, my fridge is filled with the most nutritious, healthiest food possible. And anytime I go to a restaurant and I have friends that go out to eat, I know what the healthiest thing I can order on that menu is. So mm -hmm. the reason why it's challenging for me to uh, even right now, it's 
challenging for me to eat once a day because the moment I open my fridge, it's full of really healthy shit. Mm -hmm. uh, and we can talk about what some of the most healthiest food is in the world. And that's what packs my fridge. Uh, liver is one of them. And the other two things- Sorry, Tony, gonna... I love liver, but is chicken liver, beef liver, or, or what? Irrelevant, doesn't matter, any liver. Really, okay. Um, right. Oh, my, uh, in my freezer, it's uh, beef, pork, and chicken liver. I actually struggle to uh, like pork mix liver. them up enough because mm -hmm. there's only so many days in a week that you can eat liver. Well, for me, that's every other day. Every other day, I'm trying, I'm trying to eat liver every other day, mm -hmm. uh, which still makes it challenging to get all of them in. Not to mention, I try to eat cod liver almost every other day uh, as part of my fish meal. So I kind of try to separate my meat, my uh, animal meals, like uh, meat meals and fish meals. So mm -hmm. let me pause uh, one today. second. So, so in the chat right now, there's almost like a who's is bigger competition yeah. about who's had the longest, <laughs> who's had the longest fast. <laughs> and I have to say, you know, uh, we got Roland Limosnero. Sorry, Roland, I, my first time saying your name. And we got 15 Mar days. Wow. Yeah. And we got Marco at 15 days. You know, I topped off at seven and I thought I was a stud. But uh, to bear B, you, you, to, to answer your question about autophagy, not, not really. What, what has to happen, it's, it's kind of related to ketosis, which is your, your body has so much serum, in other words, blood sugar that it has to burn through and a lot of your glucose or glycogen is stored in your liver and the, the point of ketosis is to have so few carbohydrates and so few things that can metabolize in carbohydrates like excess protein that you burn through all that serum and uh heptic or liver carbo glucose or glycogen glycogen or glycogen i forget which and then only when that's gone and your body switched over to ketones and post that phase, this autophagy kick in. So long as you can have excess, basically blood sugar floating around, there's no reason for it to commit suicide because it believes it's in a plentiful environment. You wanna convince your body that you're starving. starving. Now, uh, one thing Marina ordered, which I've tried a couple of times, is like some starving simulation diet where you you don't quite starve, but you, you consume things so you have an easy fasting trip. Maybe she can drop it into the chat. But your body, your body thinks you're starving, but you're not actually starving, which is good for going into ketosis and starting autophagy. So tell what's the longest fast you ever did? I've only done three days. Uh, three has been the longest for me. I haven't done these long fasts. Well, I don't have that much body fat uh, no, to, uh, <laughs> to do it. Uh, but uh, I'm, like I guess I'm usually eating once a day, but my problem is that uh, anytime I open my fridge, there's just nothing but healthy stuff. Uh, besides the liver, uh, I try to eat a lot of cod liver. Cod liver is amazing because it's one of the few things like beef liver. So I buy all my livers from my farmer and mm. uh, I even try to mix up my food. Like I buy chicken hearts as well, but hearts aren't as nutritious as liver. And uh, so you might as well eat the most nutritious food you can. Uh, I do want to mix it up though. Uh, but when you buy cod liver and you have to go to an international foods market, you'll never find cod liver in any American supermarket or most. So we have to go to like an international market. Uh, mm. The Russian markets have that a lot. It comes in a can and it's not expensive. It's like, I don't know, $2 for a can. Uh, and it literally is drained in its own cod liver oil. oil. So it's in its own oil, which has incredible amount of omega threes and it's just some of this really healthy stuff. And it's not that expensive. Uh, the other two things that are always in my fridge and people are going to think they're expensive, but they're not, is uh, salmon roe, which is caviar, but mm -hmm. the, the salmon roe version, that's not beluga black caviar, $185 like a gram. Uh, so the salmon roe, uh, that's about the one I buy is about $20 a pound. Uh, so that's 500, about 500 grams, let's say for, uh, 20 bucks. And that takes me a week to eat. Uh, and people, have, and a lot of people always ask me like, how do you, what do you eat this stuff with? And my answer is with a spoon. Uh, ah. you just eat it. Like it's a, <laughs> like, like I know in Russian culture, it's popular to put the salmon roe on top of bread with butter. And I'm like, no, it's so good. <laughs> Yeah, he does what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, no, he just put it on, put, put it on my plate with a spoon. 
Mm -hmm. And if you break that one pound container uh, and you eat it every other day, you know, you're spending, you know, three, four dollars, like basically a Starbucks cup of coffee. But now you're eating one of the most nutritious things in the world uh, that you can eat. My so fridge you're is living also on liver and salmon roe, pretty much. Uh, That's pretty epic, much. my friend. Yeah. And, and oysters, too. So mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people think oysters are expensive. And uh, if we break it down, yeah, if you go to a decent restaurant, it's $5 an oyster. Uh, if you go to a specialty restaurant that has, let's say, Oyster Tuesday, uh, and there are some even in cities like New York and LA, you can get them for a dollar, dollar fifty an oyster. If you buy them at the farmer's market, like I do, uh, you don't have to shock them yourself, which is a royal pain in the ass. Uh, you can get them for under a dollar an oyster. If you buy, let's say, 20 oysters, it uh, should cost you less than 20 bucks or 20 bucks at most. So buying real live oysters should be under a dollar an oyster. They're incredibly nutritious. And if you really want to buy oysters at 10 cents an oyster, you can do that too. Because on Amazon, you can buy a can of oysters. It has like 15 or 20 of them in there. And it's like $3. And it's already shocked and everything. It's literally oysters in water. Um, mm -hmm. And it's some of the most nutritious things you can eat. There's also things like scallops and a lot of other shellfish. Mm -hmm. uh, that stuff is a little harder to get, really cheap. Um, and after that, it's avocados. So I'm not fully on the meat diet. Uh, you can even see an avocado tree behind me there in the background. Oh, uh, nice. So avocados and egg yolks round out my food. So it's uh, liver, other meat. Uh, I mean, I do eat steak uh, and ground beef as well. So the crazy thing is that people always make fun of me on. So I buy ground beef and ground pork at my farmer's market and I never cook it. So I do eat uh, uh, raw, raw ground pork in my apartment uh, all the time. Yeah. Sorry, let me make sure I'm hearing that correctly. You're eating raw ground pork. Yeah. Do you season it at all? Yeah. Is it like pork tartare? Yeah. Yeah, so um, I try to go to okay. lamb um, as well. Uh, I do buy clean meat. Uh, I do season it uh, back I, when I, see, I was- yeah, I'm going to interrupt one second because Bear B has a good question in the chat. Yeah. He said, right. how do you get min minerals, vitamins from that diet? We, we was just kind of making an assumption, but I, I think that's an assumption a lot of people have. So how do you get all well, your minerals and all your vitamins from the diet? Well, that's the thing. The things that I just named are literally the pieces of food that have the maximum amount of vitamins and minerals. Uh, I even tweeted out an image. I can, um, man, I, I guess I can find it and, and show it to you guys. Salmon roe, liver, oysters. They are literally... Uh, pound like gram for gram have the most vitamins and minerals than any other food and the and the other three food the other two foods that round out the top five that are readily available we're not going to talk about some exotic like root that you can only get on some island off the coast of indonesia right um, as far as readily available food liver salmon roe oysters avocados and egg yolks uh, those things, and I literally mean egg yolks. I throw my egg whites in the garbage. I never eat egg whites. They are empty protein. My entire diet is full of protein. The last thing I need is protein that has no vitamins and minerals. So the egg whites always go in the garbage and the egg yolks always go in my food, uh, cooked as little as possible. Though, and are, sure are, you, are you cracking your eggs and throwing away the whites? Are you buying... No, no, I'm cracking, I'm cracking the egg, I'm draining the egg white in the garbage, and then the egg yolk goes somewhere. So, uh, so one of the things that I do at least once a week, uh, so I make a little bone broth. So I found the simplest way to do it. So at my farmer's market, I buy this thing called a shin, uh, shin bone. So it's, uh, it's a shin bone of a cow with a piece of meat around it. It's probably about a pound of meat. But it has a bone in there with some piece of bone marrow, just, you know, just for taste. Okay. So I boiled that in a big pot of water for like four or five hours. So this was my meal yesterday. So I filled up a pot with water. I threw in the shin bone and I let that boil in that water 
for about four, three to four hours while I'm doing podcasts, doing work, whatever. You don't really have to watch it. I throw a couple of garlic cloves in there, uh, mostly for the flavor. Uh, some salt, pepper in the water, that's about it. And then uh, when that water comes to a big bowl's worth, I throw away the shin bone with the meat. I don't really care for that meat. I keep the bone marrow piece. I just pull that out. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, but Alex from the chat says, Tony, with full respect, you probably need a wife from Europe or ex-USSR. She will throw this away for you or from you. Yeah. Is, 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 is this a reason to get a wife from Europe or ex-USSR or a reason not to? Oh, God. Uh, um, I don't know. Uh, good question. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Alex. <laughs> That's funny. Actually, you turn it Let me pause you for a second. But anyway, and then oh, one second, and, and, and then I throw in, you know, chopped I, a piece of liver. I just chop it up into small pieces, like about about that big. Throw that in there at the very end. I only want to cook that liver for like five to ten minutes. Like I, huh. I don't want to overcook it. Uh, it's just literally like because that, that that water is hot. So I throw that in there, and then I throw in like three egg yolks right before I turn it off or right as I turn it off, I throw in three egg yolks so they don't, so that the outside kind of cooks, but the inside stays liquid. And that's what I, what I ate yesterday. That was my one meal. It was like uh, probably half a pound of liver uh, in bone broth with a little bit of bone marrow in it and three egg yolks. And, and you that feel was my good, you yesterday. feel strong, high energy. I mean, the amount of nutrition in that, uh, in that meal is insane. I'm, uh, I probably covered almost every single vitamin and mineral. If I had an avocado, uh, I've covered every vitamin and mineral. Kiwis are incredibly nutritious as well. So I really only focus on 10 to 20 foods that literally maximize my vitamins and minerals. And I don't have to touch anything else. I don't have to eat any vegetables because I'm getting all the vitamins and minerals in higher quantities than any vegan or vegetarian with my diet. It's fascinating. Sandra, how about... We got a lot of, we have a really active chat here. And I know this is a topic yeah. that's near near to your heart. Do you want to, let, let's open it up and let's lead off with you. And then let's, because I, I want to hear a little bit of what we've got you into nutrition and see if you and Tony kind of meet or part paths or in parallel paths. And then let's yeah. open it up to audience. And for the audience, you can ask questions about crypto. You can ask questions about nutrition. Uh, drop the questions into the chat unless you're an alumni speaker. And then we'll, we'll kind of put you towards tone. But Sandra, let me hand it to you for a second, because I know this is a real passion of yours. Yeah, and, and first of all, we should get Marco uh, also in the conversation, because one, Marco is always here. He's really actively participating, and he's really into the subject also. So Marco is not only on business and crypto, but he's really into nutrition. But just as a, as a little background for you, Tony, and also for the rest. So I got into the sports and fitness and nutrition industry because I was raised in a family where my father was a professional uh, athlete. He played professional soccer. In the Netherlands. So for us, it was always sports, 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 sports. So my career path was already there. So I went to do sports education. And one of those subjects where we were educated in was nutrition. And my teacher, the, 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 the really smart guy, he was a professional athlete himself. He always said, Sander, you can exercise until, you know, Jesus comes back. But if you want optimal, let's say optimal health, Besides exercising and good sleep, this is the second ingredient of success, you need good nutrition. And, and that's, that's where most of the times you need to look at the alternative on what you're ed educated on. So for example, in the Netherlands, where I've been raised, when we grew up in our junior school, we were educated to drink milk every day, all day, every day, all day. Oh my God, I, I get yelled at for drinking milk now. It's painful. Yeah. Yeah, they, 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 they said, you know, it's good for, for strong bones. Well, actually, now I have a lot of experts, nutrition expert doctors who are saying it's exactly the opposite. You know, you break down bones and you increase the, uh, the, the risk of getting osteoporosis. So that, that was, so I was raised, to make a long story short, in a sports environment, the nutrition was already there. That's what got me excited. But through, through a couple of friends, they got me, let's say, off track. So I went into crypto and I lost a bit my, my passion for nutrition. And nowadays I'm happy as a puppy because I'm combining, you know, I'm working with, with crypto friends, but also with crypto friends who are into health. So that, that, that's, I think it's, it's fascinating to hear your, your story. And I think a lot of people don't know the intermittent fasting part. So Gordon, what we should do uh, underneath the recording of this, of this show, 
One is we should ask the audience and people that are watching the recording to share with their, as many friends as they can. But beneath, we should post some articles on what is intermittent fasting, you know? What is it all about? Why you need I think to that's a great idea. Uh, Maria, sorry, Maria has a question. She says, 10 to 20 items of food for eating seems like not enough as a variety. Tone, what other fruit besides kiwi? Uh, so, um, it, that's the thing. It's variety. I, I haven't done, I've done an, some research, but this is why I kind of want to go nutrition full time so I can do more research. Uh, I can probably pull up the spreadsheet. I wasn't really going to share it publicly, but I basically did a spreadsheet. I went, I, I put every single vitamin and mineral against uh, co of, um, in, in column A and I put, uh, uh, and, and along alongside each vitamin and mineral, I put down what food gives me the most of that and within my diet and can I sustain that? And it's amazing how uh, the variety, when people say you need a variety of food, uh, mm. that doesn't mean anything. You need a variety, you need to maximize your vitamin and mineral intake. Mm. You gotta make sure uh, you have the most vitamins and minerals. And if five pieces of food give you all of your vitamins, you give you the most variety of vitamins and minerals, you may think you're diversifying, but you're not. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people think that you can diversify the food on your plate, but what you don't know is with that diversification, you could be getting zero vitamin D, for example. Vitamin D is incredibly difficult to get from food. You mostly get it from sunlight, which unfortunately in the last nine months, we're not allowed to go see. Uh, because we're all forced to stay at home. And uh, you may not realize that you may think you're diversifying food, but if you don't know the purpose of that diversification, it doesn't really help you. So I went out and I did a bunch of my own research on how do I diversify my vitamin and mineral intake? And is that possible with a single piece of food? And, uh, and this was the, the quick screenshot I want to do because I pulled up where is that image? Here it is, real, real quick. Um, so here is, uh, so I, I put this image up where I oh. basically looked at, so here is salmon row and here's how many vitamins and minerals and what percentage uh, do you get? Now salmon row has 58%. That's just uh, hundred grams of salmon row. Uh, so that's one fifth of the container that I bought. This container is a little pricier, but I buy cheaper now. Um, so one fifth of this container has 58% of your daily recommended vitamin D. Uh, nothing else uh, that I know has that, but look at oysters. Oysters, vitamin D, 80%. Like uh, I don't know any other food besides oysters and salmon roe that gives you this much vitamin D. So you can have all the food in the world. You can eat every other piece of food in the world and you may never get enough vitamin D versus just eating this thing. But you don't know that what this thing is. Now, remember the reason why I highlighted these, this was a picture I took the first week of my starting quarantine for COVID in March. Mm -hmm. And I went to the market and I literally bought like eight of these liver things because I didn't know if I was going to be stuck at home for the next four months. <laughs> yeah, I know. And this piece of liver yeah, was but seven dollars. Look like, this is the price, right? And actually, this is calf liver, which is double the price of regular liver. Regular liver, which is equally as nutritious, was four dollars. So I have another one of these packages, four dollars. This is like three meals right there for four bucks because Americans don't eat liver. And if you just look at liver, copper, seven hundred percent, vitamin A, five hundred percent. I think riboflamin is vitamin. Uh, I think that's B three. Uh, 200%, uh, B6, 50, zinc, 35. Now, the reason I highlighted zinc and vitamin D is because going into COVID, we, we all should know that vitamin D and zinc help uh, with COVID. And this was the big, oh. and this is what was driving me nuts since day one, when, remember chloroquine, when everyone was saying yeah. chloroquine helps, but mm -hmm. the other half of the people saying chlor chloroquine doesn't help, because this is the insanity that two people can't put the two and two together. Chloroquine itself doesn't help. But what chloroquine does is it allows your body to absorb zinc better. 
So if you're only taking in chloroquine, but you're not taking in zinc, yeah. it's useless. Yeah. And if you're taking in a lot of zinc, that's also useless, be, not, uh, you, not as useless, but it doesn't absorb into your body uh, in its maximum form. <laughs> so the, oh. the, the solution was chloroquine plus zinc. And very few people were talking about that. And those that were can be in censor because no one wanted you to get healthy through COVID. Uh, anyone else on this panel like kind of agrees with me or the audience? And that's why I tweeted this out. And my fridge was full of shit that was high in vitamin D and zinc. And it's not that these foods, oysters and salmon and organ meat are only high in zinc. They're high in a lot of other stuff, but they're also high in zinc. And salmon roe just blows everything out of the water with how many vitamins and minerals it has. Tom, what, what do you say to people yes. who, are, who are not so educated on nutrition and they say, you know, you're so focused on the minerals, the vitamin stuff. Aren't you scared that you are going to get an overload of some certain uh, vitamins? Um, like selenium in your salmon roe example there. Um, you're at 93% and selenium toxicity is a real problem in this world, especially for people who like Brazil nuts. I was just about to say that. Yeah, so the Brazil nuts, uh, the selenium in Brazil nuts is crazy. That is 700%. And uh, again, the reason why I kind of know this stuff is because I did the research on my own uh, to, to, to find that out. And I made spreadsheets of which uh, vitamins and minerals. has. Oh, by the way, guys, I, do, I did write up a blog post. Uh, it was uh, the second one down. Uh, I, I don't write often, but when I do, they're freaking long. Uh, so here it is. Uh, my diet and nutrition plan for 2020. I wrote this in January. Wait, and, uh, don't, don't drop that in the chat. And we will also put that in the show notes. All right, cool. Yeah, I'll uh, tweet it out, uh, everyone. There you go. Uh, yeah, it's just on my blog. And uh, I'll also throw it in. And Marco, uh, briefly talk about the selenium issue. That's a new one for me. Uh, it's, it's just a, it's a mineral. Your body needs it, <clears throat> but uh, it's, it's not exactly a common mineral in most foods, but there are certain foods that are really high in it, like salmon roe, and the Brazil nuts exceptionally high in it, um, and people have actually died from eating too many Brazil nuts. So when you're looking at the, <clears throat> the uh, salmon roe example, um, you're getting half your vitamin D, but you're getting almost all your daily requirement for uh, selenium. So you might think, well, I'll just eat twice as much as my daily intake then get all my vitamin D just using salmon roe, but then you're doubling down on your uh, uh, selenium, which that plus anything else you're eating might cause you to go over time into selenium toxicity. And, and then what uh, vitamin A is another one that people OD on. So you, you, I, if I have selenium toxicity, what does that feel like or what does that do? Or is it just uh, it's a lot like metal poisoning. Oh, lovely. So heavy metal poisoning. Yeah. So, so let me ask to so Paul yeah. Biondich, if I'm saying his name correctly, made an interesting point in the comments. He said this conversation sees more pro meat as a source of nutrition versus pure carnivore lifestyle. So my gloss on that is, is meat a means to the end or is it an end? Like you want to go there anyway? Um, I'm not sure if I want to go. I don't know if that question was for me or not, but just, just not everyone, sure I, but we're starting with you. I'm not sure if I want to go fully into just the meat, uh, but uh, for me, it was about eating the most nutritious food. And uh, that's kind of how I, I do it. Uh, and that's why I continue to eat avocados and I continue to eat kiwis. And there was a question, what other fruit? I eat berries, uh, blueberry, raspberry, blueberry. blackberry. Mm -hmm. uh, I also personally really like pineapple and uh, mangoes uh, and exotic fruits. Like when I'm in Asia, I'm usually eating dragon hey, fruit. I got a mango tree right out front. Come visit. <laughs> oh, wow. well, where are you? You're in the Caymans. I'm in the Cayman Islands. Ah. Yeah, no vitamin D problem here. No, that, yeah, <laughs> Marco is known for having his shirt off. So just be, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so well, I'm doing my work. So by the way, here, so, so here's the work that I did. Um, so you were talking about Brazil nuts. So here it is. And this is based on 28 grams. So about a handful of nuts. 
And uh, so this is the kind of stuff that I did on my, I was, uh, I, I just got tired of crypto for like a couple of weeks and I just went and put these spreadsheets together of different foods. Uh, and uh, for Brazil nuts, here it is, 767% of your daily selenium intake, which is insane, uh, but uh, from a handful of nuts, Brazil nuts. So because I'm eating salmon roe these days, I'm actually not eating a lot of Brazil nuts. Nuts are pretty nutritious but mm -hmm. I am cutting nuts out of my diet. Um, I still- uh, Wait, entirely? Uh, I still, I'm almost, I'm getting there. Uh, people have to remember that peanuts aren't nuts. Just keep no. that in mind. Peanuts are beans. Uh, they're not nuts. They're in the bean family. Uh, but um, I have been cutting nuts out uh, because I'm getting all this stuff from other sources uh, like meat and fish. Uh, the vitamin A is interesting. So you did mention that, let me see if I have another one of these uh, spreadsheets. Uh, like I said, like a lot of this is going to be like proprietary kind of uh, work. What is this? This, so, is... Uh, this is all work in progress, but it's fascinating. So don't, don't, don't be bashful. It's very, uh, I've never had this conversation actually. So uh, let me stop screen share. So the vitamin A, so, okay. So there are some vitamins and minerals that where, where there's no limit. Um, so vitamin B, for example, there's really no limit on how much you can have. There's also water soluble and uh, like fat soluble. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but there are uh, a few, like Marco said, where you don't want to overdose on. Selenium is certainly one of them. Um, but you're not going to get that much selenium. Vitamin A. Right. You know, vitamin A is actually becoming debatable. Um, so vitamin A is becoming debatable because... Uh, the instances that I've read about where people really got sick on vitamin A were from exotic livers. We're talking polar bear, husky. Uh, husky. They were. Hmm? Someone killed a husky? Well, yeah. Yeah, really? Off, well, what well the keep hell? in mind. They, you know, they deserve hey. to die. I mean, well, someone no, killed a polar bear? No, no, no. Hey, Gordon, Gordon, Gordon. If you're stuck up there in Alaska and it's you or your dog, uh the, what, then, what then i'm killing my neighbor and feeding my dog well no no, no, no. literally if you're out there no there was an incident oh then my dog dies but you know i, I hikers human like dog hikers. dog <laughs> no, no 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 uh there were hikers that got stranded and they had you know the sled with a I bunch know, of husbands. i know i know i, I don't want to hear about that stuff go, go ahead and, and um and they actually got sick one of them died the other one barely survived so a lot of these vitamin a overdose uh incidents uh, have generally been exotic animals with significantly high vitamin A versus like a cow or a pig uh, mm -hmm. versus the, the more domesticated stuff. Huh. So that one is a little bit debatable, even though I do mention it in my article about the potential of vitamin overdosing. Uh, but also keep in mind, why do this? I don't supplement with vitamins. Like so many people are supplementing with vitamins. Uh, which is another thing I'm against. I'm against supplementing with vitamins. I make sure I get it all from food. Uh, but yeah, ideally, uh, you want to. I want to refine this a little bit so there are some uh, action and more research needs to be done. And this is why I want to go to grad school to kind of do it and fine tune this kind of uh, maximizing your vitamin mineral intake with. Uh, the least amount of food to do it because I know I can easily go uh, even in with me uh, without much body fat to lose. I can easily go a week, no food. And I know I will not be vitamin deficient, even though there are vitamins that you kind of mm -hmm. need to take almost every day, every other day, uh, but, or intake into your body. Uh, or, so that's or kind in of, a pause, cause I, what, what is the vitamin you need? Yeah, I was going to say, I don't know, Tone, about what your body BMI is. Mine is 7%. Uh, if I go to a doctor and they don't know me any better, they'd say, dude, you got to eat something. And I look, I just laugh because there's no point. When I went on my 14-day fast, I gained weight. Um, <clears throat> the, 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 one of the key things that uh, we don't talk about very much is that the human body itself, if you've got good flora in your intestinal tract, can take almost any source of carbohydrates and turn it into whatever vitamin or mineral is needed with the exception of a few, like for example, not minerals so much, sorry, uh, vitamins. Uh, you, can't, you can't make vitamin C in your body. 
So you need some external source for vitamin C, but a vitamin, vitamin D your body can make, vitamin A, B, B complex can all be made internally in your body. And Sorry, Marco, that's you, the whole you, you purpose behind fasting. Carbohydrates? I, I, I find it hard to believe that just, I mean, carbohydrates, does it have the raw material? I find that a little hard to believe as well. But... Your body... Like your yeah, body has I, the raw I, I materials getting it from food in general but from carbohydrates only i find that i find that unlikely you know you get it from food in general obviously but uh, carbohydrates that you can you when you're on a fast for 14 days you don't do nothing right i mean you're you're basically taking in a liquid form of food that is doesn't require digestion so it leaves your intestinal tract inactive from a digestion standpoint allowing it to move into detoxification mode and take care of senescent cells, et cetera, et cetera. Um, okay. the, 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 go, the thing that, I, that we've discovered is that, that your body can manufacture just from, in, in the case of mine, my favorite one is using the lemonade fast. Just what's in the, that lemonade is enough um, to get you enough of the minerals and everything. I mean, I felt fantastic when I was on it. The first three days are, are killer just because you're breaking the food addiction. And then the rest of them, it's more social pressure. You know, you watch your friends eat and you kind of wish you could have that taste in your mouth kind of thing. But uh, so, I felt fantastic let me, let me the entire time. You. I put on weight. So uh, just, go just Googling just Wikipedia, and I, I don't claim to be an expert at all, believe me. But a carbohydrate has three atoms to make it up. There's carbon, there's hydrogen, and there's, sorry, there, uh, yeah, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, which makes sense, carbohydrate. The, to the extent that any vitamin or mineral has any element in it that's not one of those three, I don't, I mean, you look, I'm not an expert, there's, but there's that idea of like essential amino acids, like amino acids you can't possibly create yourself because your body doesn't have the mechanical tools to do it and you have to get it from an external source. I, I think you could certainly maybe uh, manufacture a vitamin. That's acid. where your biota. That's where I mean, your biota you, comes in. But your, your flora is not going to create something. Your intestinal flora. No, you're not creating it from nothing. Your intestinal flora consume it and create the other things you need. You this is one of the that, problems we're facing in this world today. Is everything is so sterile. Uh, you, in American food that is processed is sterile. And you go to France, the cheese isn't even pasteurized. And in fact, it tastes better in France than French cheese that tastes elsewhere. No doubt, yeah, I'm, not and, a, I, I'm nipping slightly, but I, I don't think your flora is going to turn oxygen into hydrogen. I don't think I don't think it's going to change one. Else. I don't think it's going it to doesn't need to. You have lots of hydrogen in the in the carbon in the carbohydrate. You also have carbon. Okay, but suppose right? you have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen are the are the core core molecules you need to make most life forms, with the exception of you need a little bit of magnesium to make chlorophyll. You need a teeny bit of iron to make hemoglobin. Everything so, else is. Pretty much oxygen, carbon, and hydrogen. Are you, are you claiming, and I don't know whether you're right or wrong, because this is not my area. Are you claiming the, the majority of vitamins are only made up of those three elements? But how they're arranged. That's okay, the whole but, point, but, right? But yes or no. They're, they're, are you claiming that the majority of vitamins are only made up of those three elements in some condition? Are organic molecules, yes. Okay, wait, wait, they're wait, organic wait. molecules, okay, yes. Hold on, don't, don't reframe the question. Take the questions I gave it to you. Are you saying that most vitamins are made up of only carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen? No. Okay. I'm fine. saying we're, that they're we're, mostly we're, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. But, but okay, that may be true, and I, I honestly don't have an opinion. But if it's mostly, you need some external source for that last little nugget to complete the synthesis, even if it's minute. Over time, yes. Which is, I mean, for example, with the lemonade fast, you're getting that from the raw lemon. Right, and so do, you, do you distinguish between dry fasts, wet fasts? When you, when you, so you, when, I, what's a dry fast? No water, no liquid. But, it, but then you start burning. Oh, that, you can't do that for more than what? Is it five days and then you, then you die? No, it's a week. <laughs> the, the, benefit of, the benefit of that is you start, what's called, it's called molecular water. You start breaking down carbohydrates because that, that your, your carbohydrates have basically water in there. They have the hydrogen and they have the oxygen. So when your body is getting too low on water, you burn your carbohydrates. You get to ketosis faster. If you say you do a dry fast for a day or a couple of days, obviously you don't want to push it because your body needs water, but you're... Uh, Mahab, I, I'm not entirely... I, 
Well, I think, Bob, to, to your point, I think there's an intermediate stage of glycogen or gly, gly, glycogon. I'm, I'm using the wrong words and I'm not saying it exactly, but I, I think the way it's stored in your liver, I agree, it's not as a carbohydrate, but I don't think stored necessarily as a fat either. Yep. Maybe it's glucagon, but Sandra. No, even if it's stored as fat, it's still, it's still got water in it if you want to break down the molecules and turn them into carbon and water. Sure. Uh, I'm sorry. I was kind of multitasking a, a chat conversation and conversation with you guys. So, you know, I'm going to pause for a minute. No, yeah. Sandra, since you know more about this yeah. stuff than I do. Well, it seems like that Marco also knows, knows a lot of this, this sure. shit. And I'm not a doctor. I'm not a nutritionist. You know, I know some of the sum. I always like to learn and keep an open mind. So I'm not saying what Marco is saying is true or not. I'm just receiving the info. I think that's what we all should do. I think we're learning. And we, we did get some additional questions, Gordon. Maybe we can do that. All, all, all yours. This is not about us. But and I'm going to shock us. everybody. <laughs> cool, cool. Let, let me scroll back because I had a question. Uh, somebody was, oh yeah, that's Maria. So Maria was asking to tone. The other question is how you arrive to the point to eat once a day. It seems a big barrier as we usually eat three times a day or even more often. In other words, what was your starting point in the way to the intermittent fast and what problems did you face? So some you already discussed a little bit, but maybe you can expand a little bit. Mostly, mo mostly the problem was mental. It, it was a mental problem because I'm, I'm pretty busy. And uh, the main reason why I was eating two or three times a day uh, for a while was because I thought that was the healthier way to do it. Yeah. And uh, I was actually pretty busy. I'm like, man, I don't want to stop and eat, but I kind of have to stop and eat because I think it'll make me more productive later. And then once you listen to enough people and you realize the mental barrier, no, 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 don't eat. It'll actually make you healthier. It'll make you think clearer. It'll allow you more productivity. So once I got over this mental barrier, that eating uh, less is not only more, it's more healthy than unhealthy. Like that's all I needed. Like I wanted to eat once a day, but I wasn't doing it because I thought it would be bad for my body. Uh, but once you... Uh, uh, look into it a little bit more and you look, you read a couple of uh, posts from doctors that recommended intermittent fasting. Once that mental barrier was gone, it was so easy for me. Great. Yeah. I think it's all about building new, I don't know the English words for it, but, but building new things you're adjusted to, right? It's, it's like raising your kids. The first few days that they have to brush their teeth, it's new, it's not in their system, but once you get rid of the old habits, and you get in the new habits, it's just the, the, the way it is. So, yeah. So, cool. so I have a question. When you do your one meal per day, when are you doing that meal? It doesn't really matter to me. It's whenever there's food in front of me, I just make sure I eat the healthiest food in front of me in the highest quantity so that I'm not hungry the rest of the day. Uh, usually it's dinner, uh, but it can be lunch. It could be whenever. It's... Uh, uh, sometimes what I do is because I don't, uh, you usually there's healthy food in front of me. So sometimes what I do is if I want to create, let's say a two day fast without actually having a two day fast, I would eat a really large dinner, like a nice big steak. And then the following morning I would get my eggs in and I would have like a big, this usually happens at, let's say a hotel let's say on a travel day. So let's say it's my last night in some country. And then the following morning I fly out. So I would go out to dinner with people, have a nice big steak, and then the next morning, utilize that you know breakfast buffet, eat as much eggs as I can uh, with a bunch of bacon, uh, maybe a little bit of fruit, and uh, and those are like my two meals, twelve hours apart or less than that, uh, like night and morning. But now I'm good. I just had a lot of food, and now I'm good till dinner the following day. So now I can travel the rest of that day, get somewhere, not eat, uh, and then go to dinner the following day. So it doesn't matter to me when I'm eating, as long as it's not one big meal uh, during the day. It's, it's usually dinner because it just makes more sense. Uh, but because uh, I'm just not hungry in the mornings anymore. Uh, or at least once I get over that first hour of hunger in the morning when I wake up after a big meal the day before, uh, it doesn't happen if I end up doing a full day fast though. Uh, and I'm good, I'm good till dinner. I try to hold out as long as I can, eat around 7, 8 p.m. Interesting. Now, Arturo has an interesting question. 
you know what? I, I, I kind of dig this question. Um, is there any sort of metaphysical aspect to what you're doing? Is there any kind of spiritual or soul aspect? I'm putting words in his mouth, but it's, a, it's an interesting question. Like, are you, are you, are you like a, a Bitcoin war, spiritual warrior because of your diet? No, but uh, I still have not gotten into meditating. Not my thing. Uh, I tried yoga, not my thing. Uh, you know, you know my, my, my spiritual uh, relaxation is at least once a week, I need to find a sauna. Like a good Russian boy chick. Yeah. yeah you, know, you know, with the Venik and all that stuff. Right? Oh, I'm all over that. The hot cold plunge. Wonderful. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, do that. I, do, I do the cold plunges too in between. Yeah. So, so usually, uh, uh, you know, spend, uh, go, go, to, go to the sauna for about six hours, obviously not in a row. Uh, and you're going in and out of the sauna, doing cold plunges in between. Um, oh my god, you guys are killing me because now I want to go to a Korean spa, and I haven't done this since COVID. I wonder whether they're even open. But now I really want to well, go. It's so, actually the healthiest place in the world. I can't believe, like during COVID because COVID dies at 27 Celsius. Those saunas are 90. Like it just like of all the businesses that should stay open, that's the one business. Because even if there is, uh, like. COVID there on the surface, the moment you walk into that sauna, it kills the freaking molecules. Well, you know what? I, I'm going to go check if you, my, the Korean spas in LA. So we, we have a Korea town. I'm in Studio City and it's 15 minutes away by Uber, which is its own little adventure. But these spas are open like all day, every day, yeah. you know, 24 seven. So now, now if it's open, I'll go tonight because, because of this show, Tony, you changed my life <laughs> again. <laughs> So we, and, and, and if you're in Munich, Gordon, go to that one I, I put in the last last show's chat. That's uh, bloody awesome. Oh my God! Dude, Just I, outside I, the I Munich airport. Show's going everywhere. So now we're on saunas. Cool. And and, and Sandra, you you posted pictures like you once be you were once like a heavier dude, and now you got you know now you're leaned out. Was was that diet exercise or? No, it it was the combination. So although I was I was educated. At the beginning of my career in university as a as a trainer, so I started my career as a PT, as a personal trainer. Sure. I knew uh, theoretically what, what to do to be in an optimate, opt op optimal health. But sometimes in life, shit happens. So I was in a you know different side of my life a couple of years ago where I was not exercising, not sleeping good, and also yes, not eating good. So all the main three three pillars. So that was out, and I I thought I had to change something. But if you have to change everything. That's sometimes a big, big task, right? It's like looking yeah. at a mountain and you think, well, shit, I have to climb the mountain. But you have to do it step by step. So my first step was, and I was like really overweight. So 16 to 20 kilos in body fat overweight. So I thought I take the one who is impacting the most. And that, of course, is the, the, the nutrition part. So step by step, you know, you get rid of all the bad things, the sugars, the sodas, all the stuff, the snacks in between. You start eating healthier. You start eating less because sometimes you think you need to eat more. No, also in this, less is more. But what you're eating needs to be the right ones, right? So I include with tone on a lot of things. Also with the blueberry stuff. You know, not all the fruits and vegetables, but you know the, the really, you know the, the the old ones, the dinosaur ones. Mm -hmm. Those are the ones that are really good. So to make a long story short, I did that. Lost many, many kilos, gained more energy, therefore started exercising, therefore sleeping better. And now it's like a, a total solution. And part, part of my mission, I, I've got two missions. I, I need to get rid of uh, this out of my system. Two, two things. Is one is I want to help as many people as possible. So I want to make an impact on, on people's health, but also on their wealth. So on the health side, I'm looking for people like Tony, yourself, Marco also, you know, a lot of the people that are here that want to educate people, give them information, and then it's their responsibility to do with it whatever they want to do. So I'm an educator on exercising, sleeping well, and feed yourself well. On the other side, we need to educate also on wealth. Therefore, I'm excited to do this and to share knowledge about Bitcoin, crypto, you know, how you make money with money. I think that's the best of both worlds, health and wealth. So I, I think today was a little bit, if you look at the scale, we talked to some on, on the crypto, which I really appreciate. And we talked a lot on the nutrition. Most of the time it's like 99% on, on the crypto, but I think this is part of the total tech that we have. So I'm, I'm excited and, and maybe as a one additional thing, the thing that Marco and Tom mentioned also about the freezing stuff, you know, going to the sauna, you're going to the cold water. There's a famous Dutch guy. His name is Wim Hof. 
a lot of people around the world know him because he's an educator on, you know, you need to skin deep in freezing cold water. Even in the Netherlands, we have a lot of lo locations. They call it the freeze lab, you know, where, where, you, where you go in for a couple of minutes. I did it. I did a 10 day, not a fasting, but a, a 10 day. Every day you go in. I think it was two or three minutes. It was a minus 180 something Celsius degrees or something. And I thought it was like freezing cold. It was cold, but it was less cold than what I expected. It's the same as fasting. You think it's really difficult. In the beginning, it's a little bit difficult. But once you're there, and of course, you need to, you know, show some 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 balls, but you, you go on. And the freezing stuff, that's, uh, and again, I'm not a doctor. This is not, uh, not, not any health advice. But I know, I know from personal experience that it's it's an immune booster. So if you want to be more resistant towards everything what's happening now, nutrition, exercise, sleeping, and also the immune boos uh, booster with the, the freezing thing, Really, I can recommend it. I don't have any shares in those companies yet, but you know this. This is there was a study that just came out earlier this year, Sander, that said that if you use sauna with a uh, hot sauna, it's got to be at least uh, 90 degrees, mm -hmm. and then cold plunge, and you do that five times in a session, uh, four times a week. Yeah. Your likelihood of getting any mental debilitating disease later in life drops precipitously. There was a 20 year study and they found that people who did that regularly uh, had a much, much lower incidence of Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, dementia. Yeah, but Marco, that's a lot though. Look, I, I, I do this once a week and that takes up half my day. So uh, you're talking well, five... that's a long, that's a, you do long sessions. <laughs> Let's, you know, if you're just doing this as a, you know, an hour a day. We, we all need home saunas. We all need like dipping pools and saunas. But by the yeah. way, I am going to throw out this. Exactly. Crypto. Just so you all know, Bitcoin is at 12,466 this morning. So oh, it, whoa. Why it's, not? It's got yeah. a big yeah. jump this morning. Big jump. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm loving Actually, it. I had a crypto question. Go. Oh, hold on, hold on. We're, I'm going to have one moment of, let's have a moment of appreciation for Bitcoin. Yeah, Bitcoin. Okay, Marco, what's your question? Yay. Um, on the technical analysis uh, side of things, I spent a few years doing that too. And like you, Tone, I, I, I looked at it and went, this is not the way I want to spend the rest of my life sitting in front of a screen. Although COVID has now looking at the price done that. Fluctuations. Tone, stay with us. I know it's exciting. <laughs> but my, 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 my question was about the, uh, the, the, the whole nature of technical analysis. Um, while there are millions of ways of uh, running time series analyses on on uh, on data, everyone seems to uh, to a large degree stick to moving averages, trend lines, um, and uh, are you know stochastics uh, would be you know MACD is just a, a derivative of of, of uh, moving averages. So things like that, they stick to the same the same sort of fifty to seventy five year old analyses uh, styles. Uh, obviously, you can do them a lot faster now, and you can do multiple time zone uh, uh, time frame uh, analysis as well. But my my question is, do you find that the normal predictive uh, what's the word efficacy of these tools is almost specious because everybody else is following it? They become sort of a self fulfilling prophecy that then is negated as a predictive tool because everybody else is following it too. And therefore the market doesn't do what you expect it to do. Well, that's the thing. And in, in the early stages of a self-fulfilling prophecy, it actually works if everyone you know, works together. Eventually there's just no more buyers and it gets exhausted. But look, I do agree. And I do look at a lot of that stuff myself uh, for my podcasts. However, if you do want an advantage in the market, you, you are right. You should not be doing what everyone else is doing. You need to find your own unique combination. And the beauty of technical analysis is that because you have hundreds of tools at your disposal, there is almost infinite number of permutations of which technical analysis tools you should focus on. And the successful ones are the ones that find the strategy that only they know using a unique combination of these tools and a lot. I, I bet you more than half of the technical analysis tools in the, that uh, exist, no one even knows they exist. 
because someone is using it to take advantage of the market without sharing what they are. I mean, the only reason you would share some of these tools is basically when you want to be famous instead of utilizing them for, uh, you know, for private means uh, to make money off of them. And people that solve that problem, people that find a unique way to do it, uh, tend to consistently make money. While on the other hand, these popular tools like the MACD, like the RSI, like moving averages, um, you know, even if they're not a great predictor of where the price is going, they could be an amazing tool as a, um, what do you call it? Uh, a discipline guide. Sentiment analysis? Well, uh, as a discipline guide, like, hey, I'm going to get out of this trade if it goes below the moving average. I'm going to get into this trade if it goes above the moving average. So if technical analysis only brings discipline to your trading uh, and takes some of your emotions out of it, it'll probably do you more good than harm. That's a great comment. I would agree with that. Getting emotions out is the number one job. Um, everyone, we, we're, we're coming up on two hours. It flew by. Um, thanks to Tone, I'd say, and thanks to everyone's participation. This has been fascinating. I, I think I need to re-examine my eating habits even more. I, I kind of started down that road, but you just re-inspired me. Tone, I, I look forward to your professional development in this area. And, and the more you can publish, even don't even worry about perfection. It's like, it, it's so good the way it is. I, I think if you just frame it as like a rolling development, it's worth it. I mean, don't make people wait. Your, your graphic and your spreadsheet, you know, big, your, as your kind of lawyer, I'll say big disclaimer, like this is not nutrition advice. I'm trying this, yeah. try to your own risk, asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. But other than that, it's, it's fascinating. I mean, the, the thing about the row and the liver and the oysters and the scallops, that, that was a fantastic graphic. And it was just, and then also the comment about zinc and vitamin B, D, Deficiencies during Corona and how those actively help fight is great. I, I think Tone is completely engaged on the fact that Bitcoin broke 12,000. 12, <laughs> Tone, I contact help. baby. I love you. Okay, we're going to end this show. So, Sonder, do you have any, you want to land this plane? Hey, Gordon, Gordon, it almost broke 13,000. We were at 12,850. You know, God bless Bitcoin. <laughs> oh, holy, it's at 12,727. We can right. go and it hour. was a this is fantastic. I love this. Okay, I'm feeling good vibes today. I'm feeling strong. <laughs> it's not just the diet, it's light outside. It feels like a like a you know powerful hump day. Okay, Tone, it's awesome. Marco, it's awesome. Sander, lend this plane. I'm shutting up. Yeah, th 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 this is all about big openings, big endings. So we started strong and we finished strong with it with a with a good mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. heads up on uh, on, on mm -hmm. where Bitcoin is. I think today's show, Gordon and Tone and Marco and all the other people, was really, you know, fascinating to hear not only about what Tone is doing, how he came into the industry, but also on his lifestyle, on his journey, how he's taking responsible responsibility for his own life on a business side and on a on a on a healthy uh, side. So, thanks for that, Tone. We would love to have you back in the show uh, as a speaker, but also as an alumni speaker to join other people who are here so you can mingle with, with them. This is all about also about networking, you know, sharing ideas, helping each other. So, and I'm happy for everybody that was here today uh, because if you look at the chat box, the, the, the questions, the comments, people interested with each other was fascinating. So- Crazy how much, we've never had yeah, that. I, I think we had, a, we had a really good, you know, subject for, for today's show. So thanks everybody for that next week. Different speaker, different subject. We will talk about life, business, crypto, health, well, all sorts of things. We will look forward to seeing you again. We will put all the links also from Tone's website and, and the YouTube channel because he's aiming for 100K followers. So please help him on that. We will put it underneath our recording. Please forward the Crypto Wednesday recording to all your community friends. So we are building a community all together for everybody. So thank you for that. Have a good Wednesday. Stay healthy, stay wealthy, and we look forward to seeing you again. Bye, everybody. See you later. Bye, everyone. Bye.